please join me in welcoming Rachel from Google. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, my name is Rachel Puffin, and I'm an engineering manager at Google. And as some of the more observant amongst you might have noticed, I'm also extremely pregnant. So <laughs> I'm expecting a baby next week. So that's why the chair is here, just in case. Uh. <laughs> OK, misinterpreted. Um, <laughs> so today, I'm going to talk to you about Google's strategy for source control management. And probably uh, many of you have heard that we use one giant single shared code base at Google. And probably at first glance, some of you think that this is actually insane. So the goal of this talk is to actually explain to you the reasons behind why we've chosen this approach. So I started my career in the video game industry, where I worked as a software developer for many years. And um, back then, the company I worked on would be working on multiple games at the same time, and each game would be in its own separate repository. And lots of times, these games would be built on top of the same game engines. So we would have one copy of the game engine code in each of our repositories. And these would sort of evolve independently. And then without fail, some manager somewhere would decide that one feature that had been implemented in one code base needed to be ported over to the others. So then we go through this very painful merge process that you're probably all familiar with. So when I interviewed at Google over seven and a half years ago, based on my experience, I was really immediately fascinated by this single repository model that was being used even way back then. And in the sort of almost eight years since then, um, our repository has grown by orders of magnitude on almost every dimension. So as you can imagine, we've had to completely revamp and re-engineer the tools that we used to both store and work with this code base. So, you know, time and time again over the years, though, we have considered, should we split up this single monolithic repository into multiple repositories? And each time, we've always decided that we don't want to do that, but instead that we want to continue to invest in scalability. So this talk is going to talk a little bit more about why we choose this approach and why we continue to make the decision to stick with one single repository. So again, the goal here is to convince you that we're indeed not crazy for doing this. Um, I'm going to start by sharing some numbers about the scale of the Google repository. And uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the systems and workflows that we used uh, to make working with this repository productive. And then I'll start talking about the advantages and disadvantages that we've seen with this style of source control management. So first, let's talk about scale. So some of these numbers have never been shared outside of Google before. Google's monolithic source code repository, which is used by about 95% of the engineers at Google, is frankly enormous. And without being able to prove it, I guess that this is probably the largest single repository in use anywhere in the world. So our code base contains approximately 1 billion files and has a history of about 35 million commits. Um, and you can see from the number of unique source files that our repository actually stores a lot more than just source code. We have a generated source, a configuration files, documentation, supporting data files, et cetera. The one billion files, I should note, also includes files that are deleted at the latest revision and includes files that are copied into uh, release branches. So on an average workday, about 45,000 commits happen to our repository. And this, these numbers are all a snapshot from our repository back in January. OK, so our repository is huge, but the rate of change on our repository is also huge. This graph shows the total number of changes committed to our repository in millions over time spanning Google's entire existence. So you can note that not only is the size of the repository increasing, but the rate of change is also increasing. This is an exponential curve. And if you think about it, look at the, the data from 2004 barely shows up on the graph, yet that's the year we launched Gmail. So think about how much we're growing. There were definitely times in Google's history where we weren't sure if we were going to be able to sustain this level of growth. 
Um, and we've had to make significant investments in tooling to be able to pull that off. So in the last two slides, I showed you first a snapshot of the repository statistics and then a picture of the growth of our repository. But that doesn't really tell the whole story of scale on the repository. We also have to talk about usage. So not only is the code base very large, but it's also very used, very modified, and su supports a very high volume of traffic. So given that this is a single shared repository, consistency and performance are key for the thousands of users around the globe doing 45,000 commits a day. On top of that, billions of read file requests happen daily. We see a QPS of about 800,000 to our system during peak traffic and a QPS of about 500,000 on average every workday. So, you know, this is a, a very heavily used database, basically. Um, and most of the traffic that we see is thanks to Google's distributed build and test systems, um, which, by the way, uh, Melody mentioned in her talk earlier, we've recently open sourced Bazel, which is a subset of our internal build system, if you're curious. So now let's take a look at usage over time. So what this graph is showing is uh, data going back to 2010 in terms of uh, thousands of commits per week. So the orange line is commits by humans, and the green line is the total commit rate. The total commit rate includes the interactive use case, which is humans, but it also includes automated usage. Um, so what this graph is really showing is not, as one of my colleagues suggested, that humans are becoming less productive, but actually <laughs> that uh, the driving force behind our growth rate is really the automated use case. So up into the beginning of 2012, we used Perforce to host our single shared repository. And you can see on the graph, up until about that time, uh, the bulk of commits were coming from humans. But when we switched to our own custom implementation of a source control system, that's when automated usage really began to take off. Um, as, an, as I mentioned in the summary side, uh, slide on scale, our repository doesn't just store source code. It also stores lots of configuration and supporting data files, many of which are generated through automation. So what this really means for us is that when we think about the scalability of our system, we really need to think about both use cases, both human and the robot use case. And for those of you who are curious and haven't figured it out, the regular dips on the graph are due to holidays. And apparently, robots take holidays, too. I was surprised. OK, so I just threw out a whole bunch of numbers, but without a lot of context. So I wanted to try and put this in perspective. So consider the Linux kernel, which is a very well-known and good example of a large open source repository. The Linux kernel includes approximately 15 million lines of code. However, in contrast, in the Google repository, about 15 million lines of code are modified every week by humans. So that should give you some idea of scale. And again, while I can't be sure, I'd be very surprised if a larger, more he heavily modified single repository exists anywhere in the world. So before I get into the advantages and disadvantages of working with a monolithic repository, I need to talk a little bit about what a monolithic repository is and provide some backgrounds on the systems and workflows used at Google to make working with this model productive. So in the Google workflow, developers create a personal copy of files in the repository before changing them. These files are stored in a workspace that's owned by the developer. Developers edit code in their personal workspaces and must go through code review before committing back to the central repository. Most developers can view and propose changes to files anywhere across the entire repository. And the way we keep this sane is through code review and the concept of owners. So uh, the Google repository is laid out in a tree structure. And every directory in the tree has a set of owners who can decide whether modifications to the files in their directory are allowed to be committed or not. Um, and 
So these owners uh, are typically the people who work on the projects that are contained in the directories, um, in the associated directories. So a change will often go through a detailed code review commenting on code quality and style, but if you're trying to commit a change to a directory where you aren't an owner, you also need to get owner's approval. Um, in this process, it's also really important to note that there's lots of automated analysis and automated testing that happens at every stage. So during the development process, during code review, before and after commit. We even have a system in place that can recognize if a problematic change has gone in and roll it back automatically. So Piper is the name of the custom system that hosts our monolithic repository. I think some of my team is here and they're gonna be happy that they get to talk about this name openly going forward. Uh, it's built on top of standard Google infrastructure. It's replicated globally and it uses caching and asynchronous operations to optimize latency for our software developers no matter where around the world that they work. Most of our developers access Piper through a system we call Sitsi or clients in the cloud. With Sitsi, Developers see their work as directories in a file system. This view includes their personal changes overlaid on top of the entire uh, full Piper source tree. The Sitsi file system supports uh, normal code browsing, use of Unix tools, building, etc., without needing to explicitly clone or sync any state locally. And since everything is stored in the cloud, developers can change machines, change tools, and constantly maintain um, their current state of their work. Um, and also, all write modifications are stored as Sitsi snapshots, making it possible to recover previous stages of work. Um, a lot of our automated tooling also relies on Sitsi snapshots as input. So using Sitsi, developers can browse and edit files anywhere across the entire Piper repository, and only the files that they've modified will be stored in their personal workspace. So, yet Sitsi provides a seamless view of the entire Piper code base as you're working in it. Here's a list of some additional tools, some custom tools, that we've built at Google to also support this model. And I would say that if you're thinking about pursuing the monolithic model of source code management uh, to the scale that we're doing at Google, you probably want to invest in these sorts of things as well. So Critique is our code review tool. Code Search is our code browsing tool, not surprisingly, but it's also much more. It provides um, very sophisticated semantic search, cross-referencing, it enables exploration of history and the evolution of files. You can browse through your Sitsi workspaces and so on and so forth. Our static analysis system is called Tricorder, and our pre-submit pre infrastructure coupled with Tricorder provide lots of data on code quality, test coverage, and test results directly in Critique, our code review tool. So these help a lot in the development and code review process. Tricorder also provides suggested fixes for common types of errors, often with one-click editing directly in the code review tool. TAP is our automated test infrastructure, um, without which this model would completely fall apart. TAP provides teams with a mechanism to defend their code against breaking changes made by others. Rosie is a tool named after Rosie the robot from the Jetsons, and this is a tool for managing large-scale changes. Um, so Rosie, with Rosie, you take a large patch, and Rosie will split it up into smaller patches and find it up farm it out. So Rosie will test each of these patches independently, send them to code owners for review, and once they've passed code review and testing, Rosie will take care of automatically submitting them. And I, I'm talking a little bit about Rosie because I'll mention a little bit more about Rosie later on in the presentation when I talk about some trade-offs associated with managing this model. So at Google, we do what's called trunk-based development. And I should note that it's the combination of trunk-based development with a centralized repository that really defines the monolithic model of source code management. So what trunk-based development means for us is that typically Piper users all work from head or a single copy of the most recent version of the code base. 
When developers commit to Piper, their changes are immediately, immediately visible and usable by other engineers. Branching for development at Google is exceedingly rare. And trunk-based development is beneficial partly because you avoid the painful merges that often occur when you need to reconcile long-lived branches. Branches, however, are used for releases. So a release branch is typically a snapshot from trunk with an optional number of cherry picks that are developed on trunk and then pulled into the branch. When new features are developed at Google, it's very common for both old and new code paths to exist in the code base simultaneously, controlled by the use of conditional flags. So this avoids the need for a development branch and actually makes it easier to turn on and off features with simple configuration updates rather than requiring full binary releases. The fact that Piper users work on a single consistent view of the code base is really what is key for providing the advantages I'm going to describe next. So I've described the size of the Google repository and I've talked a little bit about the tools that we use to make working with it productive. Now I'm going to actually get into why we do this and why every time we've considered splitting up a repository, we've decided against it. So here's a high-level list of a bunch of the advantages of working with a monolithic repository. Unified versioning and one source of truth. Uh, you never have to wonder where the authoritative version of a file is. They're all in one repository. Extensive code sharing and reuse. So there's a bunch of uh, very useful libraries that have been developed at Google over time. When someone starts a new project, they often have a lot of what they need already built and don't need to reinvent the wheel. Simplified dependency management. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the following slides. Atomic changes. This is uh, the ability to make a very large change and have it land as a consistent single operation in the code base. Um, this supports really good for large-scale refactoring, collaboration across teams. Everyone can see what everyone else is doing. Everyone can share code if they want to. Uh, you can fix bugs in other teams' code if you find them, and so on. Uh, flexible team boundaries and code ownership. You don't need to decide where repository boundaries lie because everything is in one repository. And it also makes it easier to reason about the relationship between pieces of code since there's a clear stru tree structure and directories sort of provide implicit team namespacing. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about a few of these advantages. Single source of truth. In the monolithic model, there's no confusion about which repository hosts the authoritative version of a file. There's only one repository. If a team wants to depend on another team's code, they can depend on it directly. Engineers never need to fork the development of shared libraries or do awkward merges of copied code across repositories. In addition, team boundaries are fluid. It's never necessary to decide where the repository boundary lies. So uh, if, a if a decision is made to consolidate systems or change code ownership, it's very easy to do gradual refactoring and reorganization of the code base. A project can be moved from one place to another place, and all dependencies can be updated in an atomic change without breaking anything. And on top of that, uh, the entire history of the project being devel developed remains intact and available. Our build system makes it easy to inclu include code across directories, which simplifies dependency management. Changes to the dependencies of a project will trigger a rebuild in dependent code. Since all code is versioned in the same repository, there's only ever one version of the truth and no concern about independent versioning of dependencies. So most notably, in terms of simplified dependency management, this model allows us to avoid the diamond dependency problem. This problem can come up when A depends on B and C, and B and C both depend on D. But at some point, B depends on version D.1, and C depends on version D.2. And in many cases, it can now become very difficult to build A. For the base libra library D, it can become very difficult to release, since all callers should be updated at the same time, and that's not easy if they're in different repositories. 
In the open so source world, it can become um, common for dependencies to be broken by library updates. And it can sometimes be challenging to find library versions that all work together. Updating the versions of a dependency can be painful. So if you resist in picking up a library update, you start building up technical debt that can be very difficult to recover from. In contrast, with a monolithic source tree, it makes sense and it's a lot easier for the person updating a library to update all the related dependencies at the same time. So there's no technical debt buildup. Changes to base libraries are instantly propagated through the dependency chain to the final product. And it's worth noting that this problem exists both at the source API level, which is what I'm referring to here, but also um, between binaries. And at Google, we solve the binary problem by statically linking everything. The ability to do atomic changes is also a really powerful feature of the monolithic model. A developer can make a major change touching hundreds or even thousands of files and have it land in one single consistent operation. For instance, a developer can rename a class or function and um, do it in a single commit without breaking any builds or tests. Another advantage relates to code base modernization. The Google code base is constantly evolving, as you saw from the stats in the scale section of this talk. More complex code base modernization efforts are often centrally managed by dedicated teams of code base maintainers. These efforts can touch half a million variable declara declarations or function call sites spread across thousands of files of source code. Single teams of specialists can do this work for the entire company because they have access to all the code, rather than requiring many people to develop their own tools, expertise, and process. An example of this is Google's compiler team. Um, they're making sure that Google developers always have access to the most up-to-date tool chains and benefit from the latest developments in generated code and debuggability. The monolithic repository provides this team with a full view on how languages are being used at Google. They can do code base wide cleanups as part of compiler validation and releasing new compilers. In addition, something that I find very cool is that the compiler team can also identify problematic uh, software patterns. In some cases, let's say if we have a bug and we trace it back to a problematic software pattern, the compiler t team can then go and add compiler warnings or errors to bl block this mistake from ever being uh, used again in the future. So they can actually scan, find and fix all instances of this problem in the code base before turning on a new compiler error, which provides a significant boost to overall Google code health. Uh, in addition, as far as code base modernization goes, since the monolithic repository captures all dependency information, old APIs can be removed with confidence because it can be proven that all callers have been migrated to new APIs. So that was a brief summary of some of the advantages. Now I'll talk about some of the disadvantages. And it's important to note, though, that a monolithic code base in no way implies monolithic software de design. But there are some downsides and trade-offs that ne do need to be considered. So the main costs I've identified fall into three categories. And perhaps in the office hours, someone will want to suggest other costs. But the way I see it, uh, first is the investment in tooling. So as I've noted, we've invested very heavily in tooling, both to scale to the size of our repository, but also um, to provision resources for some of our more computationally intensive tools. So for instance, tools like our static analysis pipeline rely on data from builds. So we need to make a trade-off about how often we run these tools versus, um, and the cost of running them versus the benefit of the data that's provided to users. So for instance, with our static analysis pipeline, we'd like to run it on every single SITSI snapshot that every user makes. And that's you know, an expensive proposition. Second, there's a risk associated with code base complexity that can make understanding and working with such a large code base more difficult. And finally, I'm convinced 
that if you want to pursue this, this strategy of source code management, you really need to make a significant investment in code health. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in the last two points. Access to the entire code base encourages tons of code sharing and reuse, which is fantastic, and that's one of the advantages. But some would argue that this model makes it too easy to add dependencies and reduces the incentive for software developers to write stable and well thought out APIs. It's so easy to add dependencies, in fact, that teams sometimes forget to think about their dependency graph. And this can lead to a bunch of problems. Unnecessary dependencies can increase project exposure to downstream build, build breakages, can lead to binary size bloating, as I talked about static linking, and create additional working in, work for building and testing systems. On top of that, effort is wasted when abandoned projects remain in the repository and continue to be updated and maintained. In order to keep our large repository in good shape, we have built several tools that focus on improving code health. For instance, there are codes to help find and remove, or, sorry, tools to help find and remove dead code. In fact, Code Search, our code browsing tool that I mentioned earlier, actually has a layer that you can turn on to see dead code. There have also been several efforts to rein in unnecessary dependencies. Tooling exists to help find and remove unneeded dependencies and to identify underutilized dependencies as candidates for refactoring. So an underutilized dependency is a dependency on a large library that's mostly unused. So for instance, if a de developer pulls in all of the web search indexing code but really only needs one small function. In addition, ideally, code owners should be able to prevent unwanted dependencies from being created in the first place. In 2011, Google started using the concept of API visibility and set the default visibility of APIs to private. This forces developers to explicitly mark their APIs as appropriate for use by other teams. And I would actually say this is one of the bigger lessons learned from Google about working with the monolithic repository, is that you want to have structures like this in place to encourage sane and hygienic dependency structures before your code base gets too large. So now I'm going back to Rosie, the tool I mentioned a little earlier. This graph shows thousands of commits through Rosie every month. Um, and Rosie is the tool that's used to manage large-scale code changes and refactorings. So as you can see, Rosie is an extremely popular tool. Rosie is, in fact, also an extremely valuable tool. It allows a small number of engineers to have a big impact on code health at Google. However, since Rosie distributes code review to code owners, there is a cost incurred by teams needing to review a steady stream of Rosie managed changes. As Rosie's popularity and usage grew through 2013, it became clear that some control needed to be put in place on what types of changes were being uh, run through, through Rosie. People were very excited about Rosie, but as you can imagine, it's not appropriate to rename a function to a name you like slightly more and farm that cost out to your fellow developers. So, the decrease in number of commits through Rosie from 2013 to 2014 can be attributed to the creation of a large-scale change process at Google. The goal of this process is to ensure that the value of changes go going through Rosie outweigh any cost in associated review time and repository churn. So in some cases, this review committee can decide that the change being proposed should actually be submitted as a single atomic change. They might also provide advice to the person making the change, like, no, you actually shouldn't be migrating to that API, here's the better one. And in other cases, they may just reject the change outright. But this tool is, gives a good example of the sort of trade-off decisions that need to be made with respect to code health and engineer productivity. So that was a brief summary of some of the advantages and costs that must be balanced when working with a monolithic repository. And I would like to note that I've also written a paper with my colleague Josh, Josh Levenberg uh, that should be published in Communications of the ACM sometime later on this year that goes into a lot, lot more detail on all of these points. 
So, in conclusion, the monolithic model of source code management is clearly not for everyone. It's definitely best suited to organizations who have an open and collaborative culture, and it wouldn't work well at all in organizations where large parts of the code base are private or hidden between groups. Google, however, has benefited greatly from the advantages of this model. And our, as our code base has continued to grow, we have time and time again decided to stick with this model rather than splitting into multiple repositories. We have shown that with investment, this model can scale to a repository with 1 billion files and 35 million commits and thousands of users around the globe. So at this point, while I'm sure I haven't convinced all of you, I hope at least many of you understand why we continue to invest in scalability and agree that we're indeed not crazy for doing so. Thanks a lot.